tonight, one child killed and four injured in a horror schoolyard crash in Melbourne. Public trust eroded and future lockdowns unlikely. A review reveals the cost of the COVID pandemic. A cloud over aid in Gaza with a key support agency banned by Israel. And a woman who spent seven hours wedged in a rock crevice reunited with her rescuers. Hello, you're watching ABC Late News with me, Jade Barker. First, an 11-year-old has been killed after an SUV crashed through the fence of a Melbourne primary school. Four children were injured in the accident, which happened shortly before school ended. Police have arrested a 40-year-old woman who was driving the car. Natalie Whiting reports. Police are going to be here at the scene of this terrible incident well into this evening as they try to work out what exactly happened. Uh, police have told us that at around 2.30 this afternoon, the 40-year-old woman who was driving the vehicle uh, picked up a primary school-aged child and was performing a U-turn just behind me before somehow crashing through the fence on the opposite side of the road. On the other side of that fence were five children uh, one of them, an 11-year-old boy, has died from his injuries. The other four, three girls, uh, aged two of them 11 and one of them 10, and a 10-year-old boy, those four were all taken to hospital with injuries as well. Uh, tonight, two of them are in the Royal Children's in a serious but stable condition, and the other two are at Monash in a stable condition. It's still not clear exactly what has caused this accident. Uh, earlier, someone from the education department said they thought that potentially uh, the driver had had some kind of medical episode but police have said it's just too early to say. Uh, as I mentioned they are continuing their investigations and they say they will be in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, they've said uh, that the 40 year old woman has been uh, arrested and is being questioned as part of their investigations uh, but a terrible incident to happen here. When we arrived we saw parents collecting their children, some were hugging their kids. Uh, it's just an awful thing to happen. Police as well are saying it's had a terrible impact on first responders who were here, an awful scene to arrive at. Uh, we've heard from the state's Premier, Jacinta Allen. She's released a statement saying uh, that she's sending her thoughts and love to the entire school community. She said what should have been an unremarkable sunny day has changed and instead a, a dark shadow has descended over the city and the state and her sentiments have been uh, supported and echoed by the leader of the opposition, John Pesuto, who's uh, just said that this is, you know, a simply devastating incident. Australia's COVID-19 response eroded public trust so deeply that people might not accept restrictions like lockdowns in the future. That's a finding from an independent inquiry which hailed courageous decisions taken by leaders at the outset of the pandemic, but said cracks started to emerge as the crisis wore on. Silent cities, shops shuttered and hospitals overwhelmed. Generations changed by a once-in-a-century pandemic. The striking conclusion, I think, from this report, though, is that right now we are arguably worse placed as a country to deal with a pandemic than we were in early 2020. The report finding Australia's response to the pandemic drove a large decline in public trust. Many of the measures taken during COVID-19 are unlikely to be accepted by the population again. Delays in the vaccine rollout, prolonged restrictive public health measures and ultimately cost $31 billion. And the report said some of those measures like school closures and lockdowns must be used carefully. Because of the, the strength of the public health response, a lot of people uh, felt, you know, they didn't trust what government was doing. Heavy-handed restrictions also amounted to a lack of compassion, according to the inquiry. That's something acutely felt by Richard Smith, whose wife was in an aged care home. His family was unable to see her for months. The distress was not only felt by the residents, but by the family to see the, the distress that their loved ones were going through. 
But despite all the issues, the report stressed Australia fared well compared to other nations. We saved lives and we saved livelihoods and I think Australians should be proud. One of the recommendations has already been acted on, funding a centre for disease control. An opportunity to lay a foundation for Australia's future pandemic preparedness. The toughest decisions on lockdowns, school and border closures and vaccine mandates were made by the states and territories and weren't directly covered by this inquiry. But even so, it was highly critical, a poorly justified and disproportionate approaches to restrictions across the country. With goodwill deeply eroded, the report plants serious doubt about whether a less trusting public would even follow better targeted rules in the case of another pandemic. Stephanie Dalzell, ABC News, Canberra. Meanwhile, WA Premier Roger Cook has made no apologies for his government's strict COVID-19 protocols, saying they saved thousands of lives, all while keeping the nation's economy going. WA had the country's toughest border closures, with travel in and out of the state banned at the height of the pandemic, unless an exemption for essential travel was granted. The report outlined that varying approaches across jurisdictions caused confusion and undermined trust in public health measures. Despite the findings, Mr Cook says WA was able to keep its mining industry going, which kept the nation's economy afloat. There's nothing to apologise for other than to, th to thank the Western Australian people for working so hard to keep us safe to, in, in terms of our world-leading response to COVID-19. Israel's parliament has all but banned the main UN relief agency in Gaza from delivering life-saving aid into the enclave. The chief of the United Nations says the move could have devastating consequences for the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians facing starvation. Generations of Palestinians have called this place home. 16,000 live in the Shafat refugee camp in East Jerusalem. A community built and supported by UNRWA for decades. It was already challenging for their staff who provide services including health care and education to come and work here every day. Israel's parliament now making it impossible banning it operating in Israeli territory. Anyone who acts like a terrorist has no right to exist in the state of Israel. UNRWA is not an aid agency for refugees, it is an aid agency for Hamas. In January, Australia joined other nations in pausing funding to UNRWA after Israel claimed the agency had employees involved in the October 7 terrorist attacks. Nine staff were fired, but a UN investigation was unable to independently verify the intelligence used by Israel to make the allegations. Australian funding resumed in March, this ban opposed by the government. The Foreign Minister posting on social media, UNRWA does life-saving work. <laughs> UNRWA is the biggest provider of aid in Gaza, support which has already been reduced to a trickle. The UN's top humanitarian official has warned that the entire population in the north is now at risk of dying. Israel's ban could make it impossible for UNRWA to operate there. You won't be able to move in Gaza without being subject to possible attack. There'll be no visas for international staff, no work permits. Uh, supply chains will fall apart. You guarantee more children being killed, and I'm sorry for the lack of diplomacy in my language, but I think we've moved past the idea of sugarcoating this. We will simply see more little girls and boys in Gaza unnecessarily killed. The legislation approved by the Knesset comes into force in 90 days, a time frame which has been designed to give Israel an opportunity to make new aid arrangements for the Palestinian population. Israel's parliament backing this proposal before that crucial detail had been sorted out. UNRWA simply must be replaced. They must be replaced with other organisations that are not infected with terrorism. Yet there's nobody that can replace them right now in the middle of the crisis. Added pressure from its strongest ally, Washington today reminding Israel of an earlier threat to cut US military aid if conditions in Gaza aren't addressed. Passage of this legislation could have implications under US law and US policy. That remains the case. Tough talk that's done little to sway an emboldened Israel. And our Middle East correspondent Matthew Doran filed this update from outside the aid agency's headquarters in Jerusalem a short time ago. 
Well, this legislation makes it illegal for Israeli officials to deal with UNRWA staff. The agency may try to get aid into a place like Gaza, but the IDF controls all of the entry and exit points into that territory, meaning getting the permissions and the permits required simply will not happen. And while Israel insists someone else will be able to fill the void, we do need to point out that UNRWA has been operating in this space for decades. It was set up in 1949 and replacing the huge amount of infrastructure it has and the large number of people it has will be very difficult, if not impossible, certainly within the time frame Israel has set itself. We do also need to note that this decision by the Knesset puts Israel further at odds with countries it considers its allies, its partners, its backers. And it raises questions as to how countries such as Australia deal with Israel into the future. For all of the rhetoric that's coming from Washington and Canberra, insisting Israel guarantee the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza, this decision by the Israeli parliament shows that Israel is prepared to ignore those demands and act as it pleases. The Prime Minister has tried to rebuff suggestions he sought flight upgrades directly from Qantas boss Alan Joyce. But having failed to clearly answer questions about his dealing with the airline chief and attacking others, he remains under scrutiny from the opposition. Here's National Affairs Editor Melissa Clark. More questions, but not much clarity. Did you call Alan Joyce personally for these upgrades? Look, the, the, the idea Qantas have a... Uh, a, a number in terms of bookings uh, that are my private bookings. When he was transport minister and later opposition leader, Anthony Albanese received flight upgrades for personal travel to Rome, LA and London. A book by a former Nine newspaper reporter says he liaised directly with CEO Alan Joyce about it. But when pressed, the Prime Minister could only recall discussions about other flights. I recall direct discussions with Alan Joyce over, um, over the flights, the, the Emirates uh, or Qantas flight to Dubai. And he went on many other tangents. He attacked the author of the book. I don't see declarations that he's a former Liberal Party staffer. He pointed to other MPs declaring flight upgrades. Paul Fletcher has been upgraded at least 69 times. He compared his declarations to those of the opposition leader. I don't have a family trust. I don't have any shares. And compared their travel arrangements. I didn't have to declare any flights on private jets owned by billionaires like Gina Reinhart because I haven't uh, engaged in it. As simple as that. Except last year he did accept a private helicopter flight from trucking magnate Lindsay Fox. For all the retorts, exactly how Anthony Albanese secured those upgrades still isn't entirely clear. He can throw mud, he can blame other people, but this is a problem of his own making. And the opposition leader is questioning whether any of this influenced the government's decision last year to block Qatar from offering more international flights. I think the Prime Minister should take the initiative to refer this matter to the Integrity Commission. A spokesperson for the Prime Minister calls that suggestion a pathetic attempt at creating a headline. Melissa Clark, ABC News, Canberra. A Perth doctor who saw a teenager allegedly starved by her parents has said she'd never seen a girl with such a low body mass index. The girl's parents are on trial. The courts heard from Dr Amy Murdoch, who saw the girl in 2021. She said the girl's weight was 27 kilograms and her body mass index was 12.5. Dr Murdoch told the court she'd never encountered a child with such a dramatically low BMI. She explained to the par to parents that a healthy BMI was 18 to 25. The court was told the girl's mother thought the other girls in her dance class were overweight, not that her daughter was underweight. An Adelaide massage therapist jailed for indecently assaulting his patients continued to offend even after police warned they'd received a complaint. Jason Paul Hagon had been ordered to spend six years behind bars, the court describing his offences as it's an egregious breach of trust. Nine women brought together through their shared trauma. It's not anything that you wish anyone to go, go through, um, but, you know, we've all been in it together the whole time. 
individually preyed on by their massage therapist. Jason Poole Hagen, now jailed by the district court for six years after pleading guilty to 11 counts of indecent assault in a deal which led to 14 charges being dropped, including seven counts of rape. It was a slap in the face, um, him entering that last minute plea of guilty, but probably still a sense of relief that it's over. In sentencing, Judge Joanne Tracy said Hagen's offending was brazen, opportunistic and deliberate and was committed against women in vulnerable circumstances in his home. The judge said that when police began investigating the first complaint, they issued Hagen a warning, but that didn't stop him. She said that he preyed on his victim's shock and their fear of embarrassment and interpreted their silence as acquiescence. Silent no more. That's exactly why... Yeah. We are agreeing to be in the media, yeah. is to hopefully give courage to other women to come forward. 54-year-old Hagen can apply for parole in 2029. Eva Blandis, ABC News. Democrats have stepped up their attacks on Donald Trump after a comedian opening a rally for the former president called Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage. In a rare move, the Trump campaign has distanced itself from the remarks. With just over a week until Election Day, the fallout underscores the importance of the Latino vote in the crucial swing state of Pennsylvania. North America correspondent Jay McMillan is there and reports from Erie. Just a few months ago, Joe Biden was a candidate in this election. Instead, the president lined up in his home state of Delaware to cast an early ballot for his deputy. And this is your ballot? You can step right on the floor. <laughs> Joe Biden also using the opportunity to weigh in on a scandal on the other side of politics. It's simply embarrassing. It's beneath any president. Donald Trump's campaign has tried to distance itself from a comedian's remarks at the former president's recent Madison Square Garden rally. But there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah, I think it's called Puerto Rico. A spokeswoman for Mr Trump said the comment didn't reflect his views about the US territory, while his running mate tried to play the whole thing down. I'm not going to comment on the specifics of the joke, but I think that we have to stop getting so offended at every little thing in the United States of America. People living in Puerto Rico aren't allowed to vote in presidential elections, but in the critical state of Pennsylvania, more than 50% of eligible Latino residents are of Puerto Rican descent. He said a lot of things about Latinos coming from South America through the, uh, through the border. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's, people, I guess, are used to, you know, his behaviour. Kamala Harris's campaign has seized on the opening. They want a president of the United States who's about uplifting the people and not berating, not calling America a garbage can. With just over a week until Election Day, both candidates are spending most of their time and money in the seven states where the race is considered to be competitive. Today it was Georgia and Michigan, but they'll be in Pennsylvania later this week. And it could be the biggest prize. Erie County in the state's northwest has picked the winner at every presidential election since 2008. And he did nothing for us, so we have to give her the opportunity to show us. I just don't like his delivery system sometimes. He's very brash, and that's fine. That is who Donald Trump is. A battleground within a battleground that could prove decisive. Jade McMillan, ABC News, Erie, Pennsylvania. The NT's Correction Commissioner has defended transferring dozens of prisoners between Alice Springs and Darwin during a prison population surge. The Commissioner says that tens of thousands of dollars spent on a return charter flight was an emergency measure taken to ease pressure during the crisis. Filled to the brim and at boiling point. A record high of about 2,375 prisoners in custody in our facilities. 
In emergency mode, the Territory's Corrections Department has been transferring prisoners between Alice Springs and Darwin to free up police watch houses, including one costly return charter flight. The charter flight we chartered, and I might make the point that that was one of the largest logistical movements in a single day that we've ever done. I think the charter flight was about $64,000 return. Uh, but as I said, we moved 20 prisoners down and another 36 back. The Territory's main Aboriginal legal aid service critical of the move to shuttle prisoners away from their traditional country. Transferring prisoners from Alice Springs to Darwin and Darwin to Alice Springs is, is creating a significant disconnect uh, from, for people from their communities, from their families, from their support services and from our perspective, from their legal advisers. They'll be away as long as I need them to be away, but I guess I'd make the point that the Corrections Act, the law, already allows me to transfer people around the entire network of corrections. Also today, Commissioner Varley revealed he'd been served papers from the Fair Work Commission, lodged by the United Workers' Union after sustained concern about the safety of prison staff. The Fair Work Lodgement is that I have misapplied my powers under the Correctional Services Act to declare the emergency. They say in doing so that I've breached the Enterprise Agreement in relation to safe staffing levels. The Chief Minister pledging prison workers are safe during this period of pressure. If there's a crisis, there's a plan. You know, we're, we're talking about a highly operational, skilled environment where uh, risk is managed every day. Authorities say some of the pressure will be released when a new youth detention centre opens in Darwin next week. Matt Garrick, ABC News. A South Australia Liberal politician has apologised to her colleague for reneging on a pairing deal during a controversial vote on abortion rights. Jing Lee has told Parliament she was pressured by an external visitor in an encounter that left her in panic mode and blinded by fear. Under parliamentary privilege, Liberal MLC Jing Lee put on record what she says was a night of intimidation, pressure and fear. As I've never experienced anything like it before, I went into a panic mode and my mind went blank and was blinded by fear. In the lead-up to a vote on a controversial bill brought by Liberal MP Ben Hood seeking to change South Australia's abortion laws, Ms Lee says she had an unexpected encounter in Parliament with a persistent visitor she had never met before. The encounter with this external visitor made me feel very vulnerable on the night. I wasn't thinking clearly and was put into a compromising situation. She reneged on an agreement to abstain from voting to even the numbers with colleague Michelle Lensink, who's undergoing treatment for breast cancer. I make an unthinkable decision under pressure because I had a grave concern about my upper house pre-selection arising out of the various media reports. Ms Lee is the only moderate Liberal in the upper house up for re-election in 2026. She has apologised to Ms Lensing, who made a desperate late-night dash to Parliament amid the debate before another colleague agreed to be her pair and the vote was defeated. Following her remarks, the Premier took aim at the Liberal leader, Vincent Tarsia. What sort of show and outfit is the alternate government of the state when women are feeling as though, or any member of parliament for that matter, is feeling as though her pre-selection is going to be compromised if she honours a pair with order, order. from breast cancer? Members, to my, members to my left. In a statement, Mr Tarsia says Ms Lee has his full support and he does not tolerate bullying, adding no person should feel unsafe or intimidated in their workplace. Harvey Biggs, ABC News. A bushwalker who found herself wedged upside down between boulders for seven hours in the New South Wales Hunter Valley has been reunited with her rescuers. Matilda Campbell had been trying to retrieve her phone when she fell head first and got stuck. Lillian Watkins explains. It was the impossible rescue oh, that's what this could be pushed over. that made headlines around the world. Rescuers in Australia had to work for hours to free a young woman who wound up stuck, wedged upside down between boulders. Yeah, you can just see her feet there. I mean, this story is just unbelievable. But it was the scary reality for Matilda Campbell trying to retrieve her phone. About like an hour in when they first um, come in, I had already noticed that the greys on my side were starting to hurt because that was the side that I was laying down on. And there was sticks in my hair, there was dirt everywhere, like I could see spiders in the distance. 
The 23-year-old's friends called emergency services who came in droves. Nice work, guys. Probably towards the more halfway mark, I was like, oh, I'm not getting out. I haven't said goodbye to anyone. I haven't said I love you to my family. But then through, I don't know what I was thinking, I just somehow knew that I would be OK from, like, the team. Crews had to remove seven boulders, each weighing between 80 and 500 kilograms, to gain access to Miss Campbell. A wooden frame was built above her to prevent rocks from falling. I'm 30 years with VRA and there's been a lot of difficult rescues in that time, but never someone down in the crevice of a, of a rock that's wedged upside down, two metres down. No, that was a first for me, for sure. The fact that somebody was there with her to raise the alarm, that's what saved her life. After three days in hospital, Miss Campbell was finally able to thank her saviours. Wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them, so I'm really, really thankful. Phones are replaceable, but your life isn't, so I would never, ever, ever go into a dangerous place trying to get your phone. A lesson learnt the hard way. Lillian Watkins, ABC News, Rutherford. A spectacular goal from Kyra Cooney Cross has helped the Matildas upset Germany 2-1 in Duisburg. The world number four, Germany, took an early lead in the international friendly. Australia answered with a long-range strike from Cooney Cross in the 39th minute. It was her first goal for the Matildas. Claire Hunt also scored for her maiden international goal as the Matildas beat Germany for the first time in 19 years. I couldn't stop thinking about it after I scored. Um, it just feels a big relief. I think we've all been waiting for this moment uh, for a long time and it's finally happened, and especially on my 50th game, so it's even more special. One of the top Irish contenders for this year's Melbourne Cup has been ruled out after veterinary advice. Aidan O'Brien trained Jan Bruegel uh, was withdrawn following compulsory CT scans on Saturday, which revealed the horse is at a heightened risk of injury. The status of Cox Plate winner Via Sestina also remains a key talking point, with trainer Chris Waller still to decide whether she'll start in the Cup. She seems fine, but you never really know until a few more days and or even in fact until they run so we're just trying to make sure that we're preserving her to ensure that that wasn't just a, a one-off run and she's got a lot more to come. Taking a look around the country at the forecast, a shower or two in store for Brisbane. In Sydney, a mostly sunny day ahead. Canberra, cloud will be clearing, getting up to 27. In Melbourne, Melbourne partly cloudy, top of 21. Hobart, partly cloudy too. Adelaide, a sunny day ahead, 26 the maximum. Perth is also sunny and getting up to an unseasonably warm 31 degrees. In Darwin, a shower or two, possible storm. Alice Springs, partly cloudy day. And that's ABC Late News. I'm Jade Barker. Thanks for your company.